This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. And where is the church heading? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly... May you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Hello, and welcome to episode 11 of the Naked Mormonism podcast. My name is Bryce Plankenagel, and thank you for joining me. I hope that everybody didn't mind having an episode that was a little bit of a divergence from the usual historical analysis. Uh, One thing I enjoy even more than learning about crazy Mormon shit is a good, challenging debate. Even better than a debate is a back-and-forth conversation wherein the Socratic method is heavily applied to challenge the knowledge and beliefs of both individuals. That's what I get every time I have a conversation with Jesse, and I just figured I would record it and give it to everybody to enjoy. I'd like to get some more feedback on what people think about the debate. So far, the feedback that I've gotten has been fairly positive, Um, but that's only if it's something that everybody likes enough. And, uh, you know, if that's the case, then I'll make it a little more available and engage in conversations with other people about a myriad of other topics and continue to release those episodes as special edition episodes apart from the historical analysis. But if enough people message me and say they didn't enjoy the conversation and that I should just stick with the history, then that's what I'll do. And if I ever do have discussions or conversations like that, I'll just post them separately on YouTube or something and I won't include them as episodes of this podcast. I might even just make it a separate podcast for debates entirely. I'll just have to see how they're received after I get a few of them up. So far, I have two in the bank that are I'm getting edited down that I'm going to be releasing fairly soon as well. So look forward to releasing those. Um, you guys might not have liked the extra long break between the historical episodes recently, but I gotta admit, it was nice to have some extra time to do some deeper research about the Book of Mormon as we edge ever nearer to the analysis of it. But we can't get into Joe's pride and joy just yet, because we need to talk more about Joseph Smith himself. He had the plates and was getting antsy to translate them into what we now have as the Book of Mormon. There were social and family pressures constantly building into a heavier and more massive burden for Joe to shoulder, and he had to find the proper valve to turn to release all of these building pressures. Unfortunately, releasing the Book of Mormon was the wrong valve to turn, as it created more pressures as opposed to relieving any. But Joe couldn't know that until he actually went to all the trouble of authoring and printing the book. So we'll have to analyze the Book of Mormon in its entirety when it actually fits into the storyline. As for today's episode, we're going to jump a little bit backwards into the timeline just to talk about Joe's court appearances. Specifically, we're going to focus on the 1826 hearing that's so well known to have besmirched Joe's reputation. That's the hearing wherein he was called a glass looker and was sued explicitly for being a disorderly man and an imposter. There were so many moving parts to this hearing, and the evidence is unfortunately scarce. But I will start off this episode by reading the entire court document that we have, then I'll talk about how we know about the trial and where the evidence came from. Let's start with setting the scene and who filed the charges. Josiah Stowell, who we refer to as Boss Man Joe, employed Joseph Smith in mid to late 1825 to do some treasure hunting and occasionally do stuff around the farm to actually earn his keep, of course. This was in Harmony, Pennsylvania, basically right across the street from the Hale family ranch. Can't you just picture the scene? Emma playing the part of the beautiful and mysterious girl next door. Emma's outside hanging up the laundry or something, and Joe's across the street with his shirt sleeves rolled up and showing off his sweaty muscles while he's arduously digging a hole, looking for buried treasure in her neighbor's front yard. 
Like, isn't that so romantic? I just love to picture that. So Joe gets distracted from his work, and apparently his record of zero treasure finds so far under the employee of Bossman Joe takes a turn for the worst for everybody. So Bossman Joe believed everything Joe had said and considered Joe to be a friend and seer coach. Unfortunately for Joe, Bossman Joe's family wasn't quite as approving or credulous of Joe's activities, specifically fabricating unknowable information from his rock and hat trick, and considered Bossman Joe Stowell to be one more victim to this charlatan's talon-like grip. We have differing accounts of who filed the lawsuit that come from different sources. We'll discuss why after reading the court document. For now, I'll just say that the history of these court documents is a little polarizing and pretty challenging to nurse the real history out. A lot of these have been known about for a long time by church authorities and were possibly covered up. These documents were sought for long after their creation and are partially damaged, unfortunately. But we'll try to uncover everything that happened surrounding the discoveries of these documents and how heated the controversy is and used to be. But for now, let's just jump right into the court notes. Quote, State of New York versus Joseph Smith. Warrant issued upon written complaint upon oath of Peter G. Bridgman, who informed that one Joseph Smith of Bainbridge was a disorderly person and an imposter. End quote. This Peter G. Bridgman that it talks about was actually Bossman Joe's nephew. In fact, most of the records indicate that it was primarily members of Bossman Joe's family that filed the lawsuit against Joe. We'll find out why as we get further into the witness testimonies here. Quote, Prisoner brought before court March 20th, 1826. This is the beginning of the document and it's Joe's testimony. Prisoner examined. Says that he came from the town of Palmyra and had been in the house of Josiah Stowell in Bainbridge most of time since. That probably meant the summer of 1825. Had a small part of time been employed in looking for mines. That meant treasure seeking, of course. But the major part had been employed by said Stowell on his farm and going to school. That he had a certain stone which he had occasionally looked at to determine where hidden treasures in the bowels of the earth were that he professed to tell in this manner where gold mines were at a distance underground and had looked for Mr. Stowell several times and had informed him where he could find these treasures and Mr. Stowell had been engaged in digging for them. That at Palmyra he pretended to tell by looking at this stone where coined money was buried in Pennsylvania and while at Palmyra had frequently ascertained in that way where lost property was of various kinds, that he had occasionally been in the habit of looking through this stone to find lost property for three years, but of late had pretty much given it up on account of its injuring his health, especially his eyes, making them sore, that he did not solicit business of this kind and had always rather declined having anything to do with this business. End quote. So that was just Joe's statement, and therefore his perspective of the situation, or at least how he reported it. He doesn't posit any fantastic claims, doesn't offer an explanation for his actions, just basically states the facts timeline from how he remembers it. In this court hearing, like in some, we get the charges, then the defendant makes his or her statement, in this case Joe's explanation of events. After that, we get the defendant's witness statement, followed by the prosecution witness statements. During the prosecution statements, I'll examine the claims Joe makes about the situation in his statement and reference them to try and tease out the real naked history here. The only witness that explicitly came to Joe's defense was bossman Josiah Stowell. There was one other testimony that was favorable towards Joe, but it doesn't seem like much of a defense witness testimony, and I'll explain why later. For now, let's hear how Bossman Joe remembered what happened. Quote, Josiah Stowell sworn. Says that prisoner had been at his house something like five months, had been employed by him to work on farm part of time that he pretended to have skill of telling where hidden treasures in the earth were by means of looking through a certain stone, end quote. Here, Bossman Joe 
as defendant for the prophet explicitly says that Joe pretended to have a skill of telling where hidden treasures were pretended that's the operative word pretended to have the skill the one defending witness statement that joe had that was actually beneficial to his case the only person that came to joe's legal rescue just told us everything we need to know about joe before he even gets to the meat of his testimony but let's continue maybe we'll find some more gems quote that prisoner had looked for him sometimes Once to tell him about money buried in Ben Mountain in Pennsylvania, once for gold on Monument Hill, and once for a salt spring, and that he positively knew that the prisoner could tell and did possess the art of seeing those valuable treasures through the medium of said stone. End quote. Unfortunately, we often see the elderly preyed upon when a private contractor is hired to do some work for them. Well, Joe had a way of swaying his elders to believe him when so many people around that person that was Joe's target that were younger could see right through Joe's swindling facade. So far, we only know this because the person that filed the lawsuit was boss man Joe's nephew, who was looking out for the financial well-being of his uncle, obviously. Peter G. Bridgman, that filed the suit, could see the writing on the wall and knew that his uncle was credulous and stupid enough to believe what Joe said. Peter was probably just going to all this trouble to wake up boss man Joe before he drank Joe's Kool-Aid and sold his soul to the whims of the genius madman in training. Quote, he found the, then there is an ineligible word there, but it's been surmised as stone, at Bend and Monument Hill, as prisoner represented it, end quote. I'm not sure, but I believe this line is referring to where Joe found the stone that him and his older brother Hiram stole from Willard Chase, which we took from the 1834 testimony of Willard Chase in uh, Mormonism Unveiled by E.D. Howe. I couldn't actually affirm this suspicion, but it seems to follow a logical conclusion because they probably would have asked Joe to show them the rock he had been using for his stone site. And the question that would immediately follow would be, where did you get that stone from? Quote, that prisoner had looked through said stone for Deacon Adelton for a mine, did not exactly find it, but got a, then a word that starts with a P, but the word is unfinished, of ore which resembles gold, he thinks, end quote. The unfinished word there is probably a piece of ore which resembles gold. I actually recommend doing a Google search for iron pyrite. For those who can't or don't really care to do a Google search right now, if you were to see this stuff, it looks just like what a lay person would expect gold ore to look like. See, gold ore itself is usually very small and panned for in mineral-rich areas and streams and stuff. Or small chunks of lumpy raw ore can be found while mining for it and other ore veins. Iron pyrite frequently sits on top of gravel beds or is buried very shallow in the ground in areas that are rich in iron sulfide and cobalt or nickel. Well, when it oxidizes, it changes from gray to an iridescent yellow and is commonly called fool's gold for its remarkable similarity to gold, to the untrained eye anyway. I would be willing to propose that Joe probably found a piece of fool's gold and told boss man Joe that he found a piece of real gold while using stone sight with his favorite little stone. You know what? I just decided on something. Joe uses this stolen stone as his favorite buddy for a long time. He uses other stones later on as he becomes the cult leader known as the Prophet Joseph Smith. But from now on, on this show, whenever Joe is going to use stone sight in his hat, he'll be pulling Precious out of his pocket and putting it in Mr. Hat. Those are the newest nicknames to be added to the Namo roster because this is something that's going to be happening a lot. So let's get back to the testimony of boss man Josiah Stowell here. Quote, that prisoner had told by means of this stone, meaning precious, where a Mr. Bacon had buried money, that he and prisoner had been in search of it. That prisoner had said it was in a certain root of a stump five feet from the surface of the earth, 
and with it would be found a tail feather. That said stole, and the prisoner thereupon commenced digging, found a tail feather, but money was gone, that he supposed the money moved down, end quote. So that was bossman Josiah Stowell saying in his witness testimony on behalf of Joe that Joe had duped him into digging for some treasure and had convinced him beyond a shadow of a doubt that the fucking ground gnomes were fucking with their treasure hunting again. It's probable to assume that Joe had planted the feather in the woods where he led bossman Joe to using Precious and Mr. Hat. Joe had probably even buried the feather a few feet down and memorized exactly where it was buried, and then returned with Bossman Joe during the night to dig up the same spot so he wouldn't recognize it had already previously been dug up, only to find one article of what Joe supposedly saw, the planted tail feather, with no accompanying treasure to be found. Quote, That prisoner did offer his services that he never deceived him, that prisoner looked through stone and described Josiah Stowell's house and outhouses while at Palmyra at Simpson Stowell's correctly, end quote. This is the first parlor trick Joe pulled on Bossman Joe with Precious and Mr. Hat. When Bossman Josiah Stowell was visiting his brother Simpson Stowell's home in Palmyra in 1825, he met Joe for the first time. Somehow, of course, the conversation moved to Joe and his amazing ability to see anything he wanted with his rock in his hat. Bossman Joe probably challenged Joe's ability by asking Joe to tell him something that only a true glass looker could know or see. Simply because Joe was such a charismatic, stealth mindfucker, he was able to cold read a description of Bossman Joe's farm and outhouse while some 130 miles away, thus venerating his supernatural abilities for Bossman Joe. This is just the first of many hooks that Joe casts into the flesh of Josiah Stowell to slowly draw him closer, only to cast larger and more effective hooks until Bossman Joe had lost everything, given up everything, and had sold his soul to the Mormonite movement. Let's hear about the next convincing little parlor trick that Joe pulled. Quote, He had told about a painted tree with a man's head painted upon it by means of said stone. End quote. Apparently, Joe somehow told Bossman Joe that there was a face painted on a tree in a forest, or maybe it was just molded in the bark of the tree. It's not really clear from this description, and it's the only record we have of this trick leading to a treat. A naturalistic explanation would say that if there was a face painted on a tree in the woods, and Joe told somebody about it and knew exactly where it was... Maybe Joe just painted it himself beforehand. Most magicians or conmen put a fair amount of preparation into their tricks to make them more elaborate and believed as inexplicable, and Joe was no different. Even if Joe hadn't set up the scene and painted a face in the tree, he said that there was a face in the bark of a tree in the woods. Bossman Joe was bound to walk past a tree that has bark that looks like a face. I see them in quakey trees all the time when I'm camping. It's just a play on confirmation bias, and Joe was a master at the art of this. There is one more line to Josiah Stowell's testimony, and it's seriously the most mind-blowing of all. Quote, that he had been in company with prisoner digging for gold and had the most implicit faith in prisoner's skill, end quote. Is that abso fucking lutely amazeballs to anybody else but me? Bossman Joe starts off his testimony telling us about Joe's failed attempts to find treasure using a rock in a hat then moves on to tell us about Joe finding some gold ore that was probably just fool's gold. After that, Bossman Joe tells us that Joe never deceived him and he believed Joe because he did some cool tricks that Bossman Joe couldn't explain. 
And he concludes by saying that I was in his company of gold diggers and I have no doubt in his abilities as a glass looker. Can we seriously get an applause for Joe? Like, that's beautiful. You have to wonder what string or combination of words could he possibly have used to convince Bossman Joe that he was for real. I can scarcely believe that this was the best and only person that could witness on behalf of Joe in this trial, but there wasn't anybody else that was involved in the situation that didn't hate Joe. That could come to Joe's rescue, of course. The burden fell on boss man Joe, whose family it was that filed the lawsuit in the first place, just to try and recuperate some of boss man Joe's money that he had already given to Joe. We have record of two other possible witnesses that came to Joe's defense, and that was Jonathan Thompson, which is included later in this document, and Big Daddy Cheese, Joseph Smith Sr., but Big Daddy Cheese's testimony is only recorded in one of the accounts of the trial, as opposed to all three of the records that we have copies of, and it was recorded long after the trial happened. I'll get a little deeper into that later on, and I will read his testimony um, when it becomes applicable, I guess. But for now, let's hear the prosecution witness's statement and see what they have to offer. Quote, Arad Stowell, sworn, says that he went to see whether prisoner could convince him that he possessed the skill he professed to have, upon which prisoner laid a book upon a white cloth and proposed looking through another stone which was white and transparent. Hold the stone to the candle, turn his head to book and read. The deception appeared so palpable that witness went off disgusted. So, Basically, Arad had gone to Joseph and Joseph put a book down on the table and put on top of it a uh, like a white handkerchief or a cloth. And then he held or put a candle down on the table in front of him and looked at the book through the stone using the candlelight. And then I guess attempted to read the book. And <laughs> apparently Arad just had to leave because he was so pissed off at how stupid Joe's little parlor trick was and how dramatically he must have failed. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. You see, when you watch a magic show or even a movie, you're watching an orchestrated scene that's designed to deceive or convey a message that is manufactured. Now, when we talk about Houdini as the master escape artist, he was also a master at set and setting. He created these elaborate scenes where death or mortal injury was truly inevitable. Then he did something behind the scenes, something that only he knew about, and like jumped out of a whiskey barrel behind the crowd or some crazy shit. Well, the problem with having to construct these elaborate scenes to convince people of your authenticity is the inability to cope with the challenge on the fly, much like Arad proposed to Joe. Similar to the periodontitis from a ruptured appendix was an unexpected outcome for a planned escape of Eric Wiesman, who was known as Harry Houdini, that eventually led to his fall from glory due to his death. Somebody challenging Joseph on the fly always resulted in disaster for Joe and his character. We'll talk about the Kinderhook plates later. They're, it's amazing. I love the next witness testimony. Not only does it affirm the last one that we just heard, which counts as concurring first-hand accounts of the same situation, but it also introduces a new claim that further speaks to the character of Joseph Smith and isn't outside the scope of possibility as far as the claim itself goes, probably because it concurs with Joe's testimony too. Quote, McMaster, we think his name is David, but we're not sure, sworn, says he went with Arad Stowell and likewise came away disgusted. Prisoner pretended to him that he could discover objects at a distance by holding this white stone to the sun or candle. That prisoner rather declined looking into a hat at his dark colored stone as he said that it hurt his eyes. End quote. So like I said, these are concurring witness testimonies that are first-hand accounts and sworn to authenticity on judicial record. 
and all of it is recorded from original copies that we still have access to. This is historical gold, and it wasn't mined very easily. But we'll get into that later. Let's get to the last testimony because it's definitely my favorite. Quote, Jonathan Thompson says that prisoner was requested to look for chest of money, did look, and pretended it to know there it was. And that prisoner, Thompson and Yeomans, went in search of it. End quote. Joe convinced Jonathan Thompson to go digging for a chest of money that he apparently knew about or could see through Precious and Mr. Hat, of course. And Jonathan even says explicitly that Joe, quote, pretended to know where to look for it. So let's get back to the testimony, quote, that Smith arrived at spot first was at night that Smith looked in hat while there. Just a little side note here. It seems like a lot of these treasure hunts that Joe and everybody goes on were at night because apparently uh, spirits are more active at night. I, I don't know. I, that's my guess. Anyway, quote, that Smith looked in hat while there and when very dark, told how the chest was situated. After digging several feet, struck upon something sounding like a board or a plank. Prisoner would not look again pretending that he was alarmed on account of the circumstances relating to the trunk being buried, which came all fresh to his mind, end quote. All right, I hope everybody's ready for this ride because Joe is about to turn his bullshit up to 11. Quote, that the last time he looked, he discovered distinctly the two Indians who buried the trunk, that a quarrel ensued between them and that one of said Indians was killed by the other and thrown into the hole beside the trunk to guard it as he supposed, end quote. Okay, so Jonathan Thompson and Joe were out treasure digging during the night, and while they were digging in the place Joe designated, they apparently struck a board with their shovels and assumed that it was this treasure chest. They stopped digging for a second to assess the situation. Apparently, Joe refused to look into Mr. Hat again to see what was in the chest they supposedly just struck. Of course, Joe was too afraid to do so because he supposedly saw the two Native Americans that had buried the chest there in the first place. Apparently, they got in an argument, probably about the contents of the chest, and one of the Indians was struck dead and fell in the hole with the treasure only to spend eternity as its guardian spirit from pesky little treasure hunters like Joe and his friends. I simply cannot wrap my brain around the perspective and worldview these people must have had. I suppose that it's a worldview filled with confirmation bias and elaborate ritual behavior, but I just can't understand it from a current modern perspective. These people really believed in spirits that would sink the treasure they were looking for further into the ground while they were digging for it. Look, if you're digging into the ground for something that might or might not be there, which the latter was most often the case with the Smiths, wherever it is in the ground, it's going to stay there the entire time you're digging for it. That's because the crust of the earth isn't made out of fucking pudding. It's rock and dirt. Inanimate shit doesn't just move through the earth's crust on its own volition. That's not how things work. Whatever is underground is going to be there and stay there, whether somebody is digging for it or not. I say this only because it's just such a vast disconnect in worldviews and scientific knowledge. We have an account of Joe saying that all the rolling hills you see in Palmyra were actually constructed by the Spanish forerunners or Indian spirits in order to conceal all the treasure they had looted throughout the ages. It doesn't have anything to do with the scientific method or geological feature formation. It's all about how the ancient inhabitants wanted to fuck with the people that lived after them. It's so fucking crazy. And do you want to hear the bat shittiest part of it? Jonathan's next line in his testimony. Quote, Thompson says that he believes in the prisoner's professed skill, that the board which he struck his spade upon was probably the chest, 
but on account of an enchantment, the trunk kept settling away from under them when digging. That notwithstanding, they continued constantly removing the dirt, yet the trunk kept about the same distance from them. End quote. At what point did it occur to Jonathan Thompson that it was a good idea to include on the record that they were digging for treasure and it kept sinking away from under their feet. That is completely absurd. The entire idea behind it is so fucking insane. And he just talked about it on the record like it was no big deal. Like it was just something that commonly happened and people commonly talked about in the day. So when I said earlier that there was only one witness on behalf of Joe, I wasn't mistaken. I was designating them as such based on the evidence given by each account and whether or not the evidence was actually beneficial to Joe's case or not. Technically, Jonathan Thompson was a witness on the stand on behalf of Joe and the defending side because he did say that he believes in Joe, but I honestly feel like it reveals more damning evidence against Joe then it actually helps this case, which is what a witness on Joe's side of the courtroom should have done. So the witness testimonies were balanced on this account of the trial, two people for and two people against. But when you take a step back and look at it, the evidence that's put forth is almost exclusively condemning of Joe's lifestyle choices. With the exception of two lines from two different people saying that they believed Joe no matter what he said. Quote, says prisoner that it appeared to him that salt might be found at Bainbridge and that he is certain that prisoner can divine things by means of said stone, that as evidence of the fact prisoner looked into his hat to tell him about some money witness lost 16 years ago and that he described the man that witness supposed had taken it and the disposition of the money, end quote. So that was the end of Jonathan Thomas's testimony about Joe that was supposedly in behalf of the defendant. Judging from all of the information that's included in there, there's damning evidence of him being what they considered in that day a disorderly man, which we're going to talk about really soon here. It didn't help Joe's case at all, so I consider Thomas's testimony to be a strike against Joe. But that does conclude the testimony in the Justice Neely record of the account, who was the justice that the case was brought before. There is a lot to talk about when we take a step back and examine everything as a whole. But before doing that, we have to finish the last and most important part of the record, which is rife with current day controversy and debate. Quote, and therefore, the court find the defendant guilty. Costs, warrant, 19 cents. Compliant upon oath, 25 and a half cents. Seven witnesses, 87 and a half cents. Recognizances, 25 cents. Mitimus, 19 cents. Recognizances of witnesses, 75 cents. Subpoena, 18 cents. Totaling $2.68 cents. So what the hell does that last part mean? It clearly just convicted the defendant, Joseph Smith, as guilty of being an imposter and a disorderly man. But what exactly does that entail? By today's standards, disorderly conduct is basically a breach of the peace or somebody who's speaking rudely to another to the point of it being a problem for the community. But in Joe's day and time, a disorderly person was anybody who practiced glass looking, crystal gazing, palmistry, pretending to tell fortunes, or pretending to discover where lost goods may be found. Well, based off of the four testimonies provided to the court, Joe was on the receiving end of a guilty verdict for just those reasons, and I would argue rightfully so. Now that we've read the court document, what can we surmise from the information, and what can be concluded based off of the ruling of Judge Neely? Let's hear what fairmormon.org has to say about the ruling. For anybody unfamiliar with this website, it's a Mormon apologist site that tries to justify Joseph Smith as a legitimate prophet, who's responsible for starting the best and most accurate religion on the planet, of course. Uh, this was written by Mormon apologist Russell Anderson in 2002 regarding the trial and verdict. Quote, What we can obtain from the conclusions are, first of all, that it wasn't a trial. 
it was an examination. It was likely initiated not so much from a concern about him being a money digger, as it was that Joseph was having an influence on Josiah Stowell. Josiah Stowell was one of the first believers in Joseph Smith. His nephew was probably very concerned about that and was anxious to disrupt their relationship if possible. It is likely that there were seven witnesses. It is also probable there was some editing of the witnesses' testimonies. All witnesses, however, testified that Joseph did possess a gift, though there is some variation about how strong that gift was. The key issue is that we can accept Joseph Smith when we put him in this early 19th century culture, he is consistent with that environment. We can accept that what he did was part of that culture, his age and experience, and it doesn't have any impact or discredit the fact that he was a prophet of God. <sighs> Seriously, if you know Mormon history and you want to have the print of your palm permanently ingrained on your face read any article on the fair mormon website because they take the facts they skim over the top of them and just grab little tiny tokens of everything and then sum it all together and say well all of that is irrelevant because it doesn't have any impact on the fact that joseph was a prophet of god they they simply can't see the big picture they can't see they can't summarize Joseph in a way that actually tells what kind of a human being he was and what kind of personality he had. But all of this leads to a very important question. Does a single court ruling discredit Joe? I would say not necessarily, because real truth isn't determined in a court of law especially when it comes to a case based solely on witness testimony like this. We aren't capable of saying that Joe was a fraud on the standing of the verdict alone. But I'll be completely honest. The facts surrounding this case have a bit of controversy attached, as can be understood when it comes to a trial convicting a prophet of God to be nothing more than a con man. But the trial wasn't actually a real trial. Based on the order that the testimonies were given in, it more equated to a pre-trial sort of situation to determine if guilt could be established for a formal case. That's why our prophet defendant was the first to give his testimony and the witnesses followed after as opposed to the prosecution making a case and the defendant reporting an alibi or some kind of evidence to remove the burden of guilt. All of this being said and taken into consideration... I did also say that we don't determine truth in a court of law. We try to get as close to the truth as possible, and that's why we have multiple witness statements to compare against each other to tease out the truth. So, for the sake of historical analysis, if we simply ignore the verdict passed down by Judge Neely, what can be deduced about Joseph Smith as a person from the testimonies themselves? Let me put it this way, when a group of children are playing on the playground, one bully child is inevitably going to hit or push the smallest or weirdest child on the playground. So put yourself in the position of the counselor or the mediator that has to talk to the children after recess and try and ascertain the truth. You don't listen to the bully side of the story, then immediately take action against a little kid that was the victim of the violence. Likewise, you don't listen to what the kid with the black eye says and immediately punish the bully accordingly. You have to hear both sides of the disagreement, then ask other children that were nearby when the incident happened to see how they remember shit going down. Then you look for recurring themes in each testimony and take into account the character of both children that were involved. That's a key piece. And eventually you can get pretty close to the truth without being there to see it for yourself. One third-party witness child will say the little kid called the bully a big, dumb butthead or something. And another kid will say that the big kid walked up to the little kid and hit him without provocation. Whatever you hear most frequently as a recurring theme from the people that actually saw it is probably closest to what actually happened. Well, we can treat Joe and this court case with the same method of historical information extraction. We have five accredited witness testimonies, all saying that Joe pretended to have an ability that he didn't have. 
In fact, the word pretend or pretending occurs six times throughout the entire document, meaning we can consider it a recurring theme. When we examine what Joe claims about his treasure seeking and stone peeping and reference it against all the other testimonies we have available, we see that Joe used the stone in the hat trick either occasionally, as he reported, or frequently, as everybody else reported. He had been repeatedly unsuccessful by everybody's account and had quit the business because it apparently hurt his eyes too much to stare into his hat with a rock in it. Ugh, ridiculous. The court document states seven witnesses, but I only read five testimonies, including Joe's. So what the fuck gives? Well, this is where the controversy starts to get heated, as we try to explain who the other three witnesses are. Before I get to those witnesses and their testimony, let me shed a little light on how we know about this trial and where the court records came from. This entire reconstruction of the trial with the defendant and four witnesses was taken from a document that was obtained by a woman named Emily Pearsall, who was the niece of Judge Neely. She tore the pages from her uncle's docket book. One may ask why a person would do such a thing and tarnish these valuable documents into a form that wasn't their original. Well, because Emily was on a mission to proselyte to the Utah Mormonites under the authority of Episcopalian Bishop Daniel S. Tuttle. Luckily, the documents made it back to the hands of Judge Neely, who was in possession of them when Emily died. That leads us to an unfortunate conclusion. We don't have the original document that we can examine and compare to relinquish us of fraudulent copies, of which there are plenty. But, using a few historical tricks, we know these five testimonies to be accurate. Luckily for us again, there were some other people in the courtroom that were taking notes, in addition to Justice Neely, who is responsible for the most accurate and comprehensive account. I'm going to read the other two testimonies that we have and talk about how we got them. Unfortunately, there is one testimony that is unaccounted for and we don't even know who gave it. But why they aren't included in Neely's account is something that I'll examine afterwards as well. They're written from an active observer's perspective, though, so we don't get to parse through raw court data anymore, but the basic message still gets across. This is from William D. Purple. Quote, Joseph Smith Sr., that's right, Big Daddy Cheese was there to defend his son's actions, was present and sworn as a witness. He confirmed at great length all that his son had said in his examination. He delineated his characteristics in his youthful days, his vision of the luminous stone in the glass, his visit to Lake Erie in search of the stone, and his wonderful triumphs as a seer. He described very many instances of his finding hidden and stolen goods. He swore that both he and his son were mortified that this wonderful power which God had so miraculously given him should be used only in search of filthy lucre, or its equivalent in earthly treasures, and with a long-faced, quote-unquote, sanctimonious seeming, he said his constant prayer to his heavenly father was to manifest his will concerning this marvelous power. He trusted that the son of righteousness would someday illumine the heart of the boy and enable him to see his will concerning him. These words have never had a strong impression on my mind. They seem to contain a prophetic vision of a future history of that mighty delusion of the present century Mormonism. The old man, eloquent, with his lank and haggard visage, his form very poorly clad, indicating a wandering vagabond rather than an oracle of future events, has, in view of those events, excited my wonder, if not my admiration. End quote. So I'll address the claims here in just a second, but I have to get to the other testimony because it's short and almost useless. Quote, Horace Stowell sworn says he saw a prisoner look into hat through stone, pretending to tell where a chest of dollars were buried in Windsor, a number of miles distant, marked out a size of chest and leaves on the ground. End quote. So that was just a kind of a useless testimony from Horace Stoll, but he was just another person that was a witness against Joe, and basically just told us more of the same that we already knew. But Big Daddy Cheese tells us some useful and interesting shit in his testimony. There's even some shit we've never heard before concerning Joe's life as a young glass looker. 
There's even some interesting stuff in there that we never heard about concerning Joe's life as a young glass looker. Well, that's because William D. Purple's account of Joe's testimony differs from that of Judge Neely's account. This forces me to read Joe's first account again, but this time it's actively observed and recorded by William D. Purple, with a little bit of a bias. Quote, Mr. Smith, meaning Joseph, was fully examined by the court. It elicited little but a history of his life from early boyhood, but this is so unique in character, and so much of a keynote to his subsequent career in the world, I am tempted to give it somewhat in intenso. He said when he was a lad, he heard of a neighboring girl some three miles from him who could look into a glass and see anything however hidden from others, that he was seized with a strong desire to see her in her glass, that after much effort, he induced his parents to let him visit her. He did so, and was permitted to look in the glass, which was placed in a hat to exclude the light. He was greatly surprised to see but one thing, which was a small stone, a great way off. It soon became luminous and dazzled his eyes, and after a short time, became as intense as the midday sun. He said that the stone was under the roots of a tree or shrub as large as his arm, situated about a mile up a small stream that puts it on the south side of Lake Erie, not far from the New York and Pennsylvania line. He often had an opportunity to look in the glass, and with the same result. The luminous stone alone attracted his attention. This singular circumstance occupied his mind for some years when he left his father's house, and with his youthful zeal, traveled west in search of this luminous stone. He took a few shillings and money, and some provisions with him. He stopped on the road with a farmer, and worked three days and replenished his means of support. After traveling some 150 miles, he found himself at the mouth of the creek. He did not have the glass with him, but he knew its exact location. He borrowed an old axe and a hoe, and repaired to the tree. With some labor and exertion, he found the stone, carried it to the creek, washed it and wiped it dry, sat down on the bank, placed it in his hat, and discovered that time, place, and distance were annihilated, that all intervening obstacles were removed, and that he possessed one of the attributes of deity, an all-seeing eye. He arose with a thankful heart, carried his tools to their owner, turned his feet towards the rising sun, and sought with weary limbs his long-deserted home. On the request of the court, he exhibited the stone. It was about the size of a small hen's egg, in the shape of a high instepped shoe. It was composed of layers of different colors, passing diagonally through it. It was very hard and smooth, perhaps by being carried in the pocket. End quote. That concludes Purple's account of Joe's testimony, and I seriously don't even know where to go with all the goodies in there. So apparently Joe wasn't born a true glass looker. He had to get schooled in some scrying expertise from somebody else before he could reach his full potential. If I had to make a guess, I would bet this person was Sally Chase, sister of Willard and Mason Chase, whom all three of these people have made quite a few recent appearances in the last couple of episodes. Sally was truly renowned by her fellow treasure diggers as a venerated glass looker, and she may have been the glass looker that was responsible for helping the mob find the empty box that had once contained the plates that was stored under the floorboards of the Smith's Cooper shop. Now we know that Joe drew first blood on that feud, because Joe thought he might be able to one-up her if only he could see her technique and get a hold of a stone that was better than hers. So, he did just that. He got schooling from her, he learned her technique, and then peeped in her stone, and the only thing that he could see was his destiny stone, Precious, buried peacefully under some roots, and its luminosity was beyond that of the noonday sun. The stone apparently called to Joseph for years, and eventually was bright enough to seek out, and Joe did just that. Maybe. I mean, we don't really know, because there is strong evidence that the entire story was fabricated to hide the fact that Joe had essentially stolen the rock from Willard Chase while they were digging a well on the Chase property. Joe didn't want rock theft to be one more incriminating strike against his character during the trial. Well, what we have here 
is another peek into the mind of the ever-dynamic and constantly adapting mind of Joseph Smith. I have said countless times that Joe was a charismatic motherfucker, and I don't mean that lightly. He was a smooth talker and a devious pathological liar, and there's no way around the facts about him. When we harvest the nuggets of truth from this conundrum of historical hodgepodge, we can see that Joe was an amazing and fascinating individual. True believing Mormons often lose sight of the gravity of their founding father. He's revered as a holy prophet of God and is basically seen as inerrant nearing the level of Jesus. But that's such a cheap view and sells the prophet short of his actual deeds. On the other hand, during historical analyses, oftentimes Joe is counted as just another charlatan who was looking to cash in on some human credulity and ended up doing so successfully. The problem with both of these perspectives is the fact that they completely ignore the human element and portray a cardboard portrait of one of the most fascinating individuals in recent religious history. If we try to take in the complete picture of Joseph Smith, we can't be satisfied with the pixelated, incomplete, and one-sided portrait that's so often the only perspective we get of him. I want to know Joe the way his family members knew him. I want to know what he thought about and what motivated his actions. It's truly a painful thing that we have to look at this genius anthropological anomaly through historical eyes, because I really wish I could meet this guy walking down the street one day, or even just have a simple conversation with him to try and figure out the human that turned the gears behind the scenes of the mighty prophet Joseph Smith. Unfortunately, I have to limit myself to the facts and just daydreaming about such a circumstance of meeting such an individual. But at least we can get close to Joe through the eyes of his friends and family. When we examine the evidence around Joe and what people said about him and then take into account what people that supported him said compared to what his dissenters claimed, we can start to see the psychological profile of prophet, seer, and revelator Joseph Smith begin to unfold. There's a lot that I didn't cover in this episode when it comes to the evidence and controversy of the trial. There are so many tangents to go on and so many rabbit holes to chase that it simply cannot be done in one episode. But the good news is that's all the information we need to know about Joe from the 1826 trial itself. And I'll have to cover the controversy about the evidence in a later episode. I really hope you guys will push the show to the first Patreon milestone soon so I can make longer episodes, because apparently 14 pages of script honestly doesn't contain enough information about this crazy shit. There's so much that I had to skip over surrounding this legal debacle, but the show must go on. I just simply need to make longer episodes to include it all, but the listeners have to show me that you want to hear it, and that you think that the show is worthwhile enough for me to put the extra time into. As far as next episode goes, we'll be evaluating Joe's actions in the wake of the guilty verdict and how his reputation suffered from it, becoming the catalyst for Joe to devise his ultimate plan, get the golden plates, and get the fuck out of New York before the mob swallowed him up and made him disappear forever. You may or may not have noticed that I jumped right into the historical analysis as soon as the episode started, without including Patreon shoutouts or the fictional translation stories. Well, I've been thinking about it, and I realized that not everybody is going to give a shit about translation stories or listener mail, and will shut off the podcast as soon as the history is done. So, instead of including my two-minute commercial for Patreon at the beginning of each episode, I'm moving it to the end. But I still encourage everybody to listen, as I put almost as much creative energy into the translation stories as I do the episodes. Well, that's not anywhere near true, but I still enjoy making them, and I mean, it really is a lot of fun, and I hope it'll encourage more people to become patrons, so, you know, I can make longer and better episodes. Speaking of, I do have a few new patrons to add to the Nemo Kingdom ranks. First off, is our first new NAMO juvenile delinquent, Andrew K. Thank you, Andrew, for your patronage. I I greatly appreciate it. Your arduous path through NAMO depravity has officially commenced, and I wish you the best of luck. Next is our new adolescent rebels, Darren B., Lee P., and Lisey D. 
Thank you all so much for supporting the show. Your willingness to give your hard-earned money has earned you a nice warm spot in the heart of the podcast, and I'm forever grateful for the consistent acts of altruism. Next is our newest apostate, J.M., Being an adolescent rebel has its benefits, but Jay has decided he doesn't want any part of that child's play stuff. He's a full-on apostate and will forever be known across the land as a great giver to the needy and a great opposer to misreported history and agenda-based education. Thank you for what you're doing for the show, Jay. I can't possibly express how grateful I am for your recurring support. This is all fun and happy in the earthly realm. But, the portal to Nemo Outer Darkness has been opened for a second time. George Green has been a Nemo apostate for quite some time, but his journey has now led him to a moment of truth. Josh Crane hasn't been in the game long, but is capable of evaluating arguments quickly and changing his worldview based on new evidence. George, as one of the most educated and respected world-class archaeologists, recently teamed up with Josh, an up-and-coming archaeology intern that graduated at the top of his class, to form the world's premier archaeologist and ancient treasure hunter team. George wasn't ignorant to the dangers that exploring ancient ruins inherently brings, but Josh had a lot to learn. George and Josh were on one of their usual exploration missions in an underground temple with a small but highly qualified team. While George is usually very focused on his work, and rarely makes a false move, this day was a little bit different. But he didn't know why. Josh could see it on George's face. It almost seemed as if deep philosophical questions of morality and existence, and even life itself, were burdening George's conscience since they had started the exploring mission, for really no explicable reason. George spontaneously began a conversation about life and death, and nature versus eternity with Josh, spreading his cancerous thoughts to this young intern, and creating an overwhelming distraction for both adventurers. But these ancient ruins, full of weak and aged hazards, and rife with danger and elaborate life-threatening traps, set by the forerunners of the ancient structure, aren't forgiving to distractions. George was the point man on the exploratory crew, having more wisdom and knowledge than everybody else on the team combined, with Josh walking right behind him while carrying on this conversation. But unfortunately, George was off his game on this fateful translation day. Just as the exploration team entered a new room, George and Josh, lost in much deeper thoughts and conversation, haphazardly stepped on a shifting trap tile that set off a deadly stream of events. As soon as George realized what his hasty move precipitated and the danger he'd put Josh and the entire team in, he knew he needed to act quickly or dire consequences would befall the entire team of noble scientists and archaeologists. Among bone-chilling noises of shifting tile and rock, all concealed by complete darkness, George ordered everybody to retreat back into the corridor that they arrived from and hoped that their moment of distracted carelessness didn't cost everybody their lives. The entire team is running through blackness with only the light of flashlights and previously dropped glow sticks to illuminate their escape path. There's a disturbing and approaching noise that's getting louder and louder in the darkness behind the fleeing group of frightened intellectuals. It was at this moment that George realized his order to retreat as soon as the words left his mouth had doomed everybody to their deaths. The noise grew to a deafening level, and a quick glance over their shoulders told George and Josh, now running shoulder to shoulder, that they are fleeing from an unstoppable force. Gravity and an expertly crafted, massive rock sphere, wall to wall in the corridor, rolling at a deadly pace behind the helpless team. It all comes down to this final moment, married to the crux of a true sense of humanity. George and Josh both know what needs to be done. Sacrifice themselves and save the entire team from inevitable destruction. They both enter a sense of higher understanding, and the world momentarily slows to a near-dead stop. They've come to understand everything now 
with inevitable death for them and their family of explorers bearing down on their collective psyche. The true realization of presence and mortality occurs in the minds of these soon-to-be heroic individuals. There is no meaning beyond life itself. In fact, the most important thing about life is the fact that we are being smart enough to have life and to contemplate and appreciate our own existence. The simple fact that we can play and be happy and love or hate and despise our fellow human beings is all that life is, and that's what's so great about it. We don't need an overwatching eye or eternal ultimatums as consequences for our worldly actions. We just need to be fucking decent and honest people to one another, and above all, we need to watch out for and help each other every opportunity we get. Everything was moving so slowly from George and Josh's perspective that they could take in everything that was happening. As both men heroically turned to face their death in an effort to slow the stone and save the team, there appeared a very small, glistening light from behind the stone. Demon Julie had come to soul reap her Nemo Kingdom recruits. George and Josh were facing the Rolling Stone with full intent to sacrifice themselves, fighting a fundamental force of nature, but Julie won't have it end so catastrophically. With the glowing talisman in her spiritual hand, she determines George and Josh to be worthy enough to enter the Nemo realm and become the second and third Nemo demons currently ruling the outer darkness realm. A microsecond of calculation and foresight indicates the exact place on the massive stone marble to place the translation talisman. As the stone is about to collide with the man-made meat wall, George and Josh both see the glimmer of the talisman. And as the stone is colliding with their bodies and their massive hearts, they barely touch the talisman with the tips of their fingers. And there's nothing but silence. The act these two men performed was the most heroic act Demon Julie has ever seen. And she rewarded the two newly translated demons by translating the deadly momentous rock sphere into some unknown time and place, and effectively rescuing the team of explorers left behind in the Earth realm, just as a token of gratitude for the altruistic behavior to their fellow human beings that George and Josh exhibited. Welcome to being Nemo Demons, gentlemen. I really do appreciate the support you provide for the show, and I hope you enjoyed the extra content that Nemo Outer Darkness unlocks. So, if you want a shout-out or a Nemo Outer Darkness translation story like Julie, George, and Josh have now gotten, or even something more elaborate, check out patreon.com and search for the Naked Mormonism podcast. Just a heads up, as I'm recording this, I think I'm at 98 Facebook page likes. I'm so close to the milestone, I can taste it. But I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for the influx of social media that I've seen and for the extra like Twitter follows and the extra Facebook likes. It's just everything is it's going really well and I'm enjoying what everybody is doing lately with with the feedback that I've gotten so far. So just thank you everybody and I'm really excited to reach that, you know, 100 like milestone as soon as it hits. It's just I don't know what it'll be. I'm so antsy about it. I also did have one more person to thank. John P. I've had a little bit of collaboration with John uh, since the show started, and he recently sent me a message saying that my audio quality sucks. Well, everybody may have noticed that there's been a bit of a quality increase in the uh, recording sound. That's because John P. sent me a one-time PayPal donation that kind of uh, kicked off me upgrading my equipment, and, well... I think the show is better for it, so I really do appreciate the uh, one-time donation. John, that was really, really kind and gracious of you, and, you know, those little bumps in addition to the patronage is just a huge help and, you know, allows me to make the show a higher quality, so it's, yeah, I just really do appreciate it. Anyway, um, I guess that pretty much concludes this episode. Join me next episode as we inch closer and closer to the Book of Mormon analysis that I'm so excited about. I'll talk at you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
got a little piece of bonus content. So I really, really wanted to include this somewhere, but I, I just came across it in my research and I just have to, I have to keep this in here. It doesn't really fit into the episode. It's not really pertinent to anything, but it's just really, really interesting. So it's just going to be a bonus content. This is from W.R. Hine. Quote, Martin Harris introduced himself to me and said they were going to bring the world from darkness into light. Martin's wife cooked for them, and one day while they were at dinner, she put 116 pages, the first part they had translated in her dress bosom, and went out. They soon missed the 116 pages and followed her into the road and demanded them of her. She refused and said if it was the Lord's work, you can translate them again, and I will follow you to the ends of the earth." Dr. Seymour came along, and she gave them to him to read, and told him not to let them go. Dr. Seymour lived one and a half miles from me. He read most of it to me when my daughter Irene was born. He read them to his patients about the country. It was a description of the mounds of the country, and similar to the Book of Mormon. I doubt if the 116 pages were included in the Book of Mormon. After I came to Kirtland... In conversation with Martin Harris, he has many times admitted to me that this statement about his wife and the 116 pages, as above stated, is true. I heard a man say, who was a neighbor to the Mormon Smith family in Palmyra, New York, that they were thieves, indolent, the lowest and meanest people he had ever saw or heard of. Hiram was the best of the family. Many letters were received from Palmyra, stating the bad character of the Smiths, end quote. You know, I'm not really sure what to say about that, but I've been searching for a while for some evidence that Lucy Smith did steal the 116, or sorry, not Lucy Smith, Lucy Harris, Martin Harris's cousin wife, stole the 116 pages from Martin or from the Smith household, but I haven't been able to find a single quote that actually explicitly said that until this quote, and I love it. It's absolutely beautiful. And beyond that, it just uh, tells us the character of the Smith family, and they're all horrible people clothed in rags, and they were devious, and, well, you know, I guess they did what they had to to survive. Well, it worked. And one of the Smith children is responsible for creating one of the fastest growing and biggest religions slash cults in recent modern history, so fuck it. I guess it worked. Oh well, thanks for joining me for the extra at the end. Talk at you later.